acting as facilitators by enhancing capabilities, removing unnecessary barriers and other impediments across previously separate policy areas, and addressing market failures that hamper research and development, innovation, education and skills development, and generally improving the competitive conditions for the digital content industry, and helping, crucially perhaps, to overcome the lack of finance. So how has the UK government gone about promoting a pro-digital content business environment? Well, we see three areas for us, uh, for, for our involvement in the, in the sector and working with the sector. Firstly, in promoting an enabling environment. The creative industry sector in the UK employs about two million people and contributes 60 billion pounds to the economy. That's about 7% of GDP. So it's a strong sector, but inevitably facing the challenge of global competition, and it does need support structures. And it needs an abundant pool of talented people with the right skills to meet the challenges ahead. So the government uh, took the position that, uh, firstly, the creative industries need to move from the margins to the mainstream of economic thinking. Also, that the creative industries will be important, not only for the UK's national prosperity, but for the UK's ability to put culture and creativity at the center of national life. Finally, the government took the position that public funding will stimulate creativity and sharpen our creative and competitive edge through support for the arts and through its commitment to public service broadcasting. So in pursuing these objectives, the Creative Britain strategy was launched in February this year and with the aim of making the creative industries accessible to a wider pool of talent and to support the fast-changing creative sector and enable it to grow. It builds on the partnership that I described earlier between the government and the industry and has launched a number of initiatives at both the national and local level. Too many to recount here, but uh, these include such things as a Find Your Talent program in schools, a talent pathway scheme for finding apprenticeships and careers in the creative industries, the development of a national skills academy for the creative industries, and the creation of an academic hub supporting collaboration between schools and higher education to provide end-to-end -end development of creative skills from the age of 14 to 25. The Creative Britain strategy also provides for funding of research, innova innovation and knowledge transfer in the creative industries. There is also a creative economy program launched under the strategy aimed at combining artistic excellence with commercial potential two things that quite often don't go together. And also their support for creative clusters, such as mixed media centers and, re and uh, through regional development funding, ensuring that those uh, clusters really take off and attract new entrants and uh, com continue to be dynamic. I can also announce here that uh, a World Creative Business Conference it's going to be called Cabinet. I'm not really sure why Cabinet, but that certainly has a, has a government uh, resonance. This conference is going to be in the UK. It's planned for the autumn next year. I don't have the exact date and venue yet, but uh, if you check our ministry website, www.ber.gov.uk, you will you'll find information about that and when uh, the arrangements for the conference start to firm up those will be put on the website. The second uh, major area for uh, government that we, that we see is important is enhancing the infrastructure. The digital and communication sectors are already a significant source of Britain's economic and cultural strength. They underpin much else in our economy and have a major impact on our quality of life. But traditionally, the voice of the communication sectors in government has had less force than it might. 
because it's been heard in separate places, broadcasting here, internet there, telecoms there, the content industry covered by other parts of, 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 of government too. But convergence is making it important that the government actually brings all this together and makes the sector's voice truly heard. It's a big industry in the UK, of course. Its, it's value is about 50 billion pounds. But it's facing challenges in, in the global market. And we've got, of course, the global downturn to, to uh, face as well. So the industry has a lot of potential, but there are a lot of issues to address. And these developments led to uh, Gordon Brown, the Prime Minister, creating the post of a single minister, one for communications, technology, and broadcasting. That's uh, Stephen Carter, now Lord Carter, who was previously uh, the chief executive at, at Ofcom, the, the, the telecoms regulator. And the minister has launched the, the second key strategy in, in the UK's uh, approach to uh, the communications and content industry sector, and that's called the Digital Britain Report. This will, amongst other things, analyze how to maximize the coverage and service levels in next generation broadband, uh, an issue that was touched on in one of the earlier presentations. How to accelerate a fully functioning, liberalized market in wireless spectrum. How to fund and finance investment in UK originated content. And how to assess in detail the impact of convergence and new media on business models, public service content, and in particular news and radio. The work in preparing this report will also examine issues such as internet security, safety and content, intellectual property, and the critical role of education and how competitive our education and skills industry is and the system is uh, in the ICT area generally. So the aim of this report is to create a framework for decisions and an implementation plan for action that will secure the UK's place at the forefront of innovation, investment and quality in the digital and communications industries. The work's already started. There will be an interim report in January 2009. Again, look out for that on, on the Burr website. The full report is aimed to be published uh, next spring. The third area where we see the government as having a vital role is fostering the business and regulatory environment. And following on from points that Steve in particular made earlier, perhaps the most important area of work is building a strategic framework for copyright. Copyright is the foundation upon which creative industries are built, and rights holders must see a return on their investment. And we need to ensure we have a strong system that supports creativity and promotes investment. Taking forward the Gowers report, which was an independent review of the intellectual property framework that was conducted in 2005-2006, the UK's copyright review, and this is maybe the third key sort of strategic element in, in our approach, will ask some, uh, address some key questions. Do we have a system that supports creativity and promotes investment and jobs and which inspires the confidence of business and users? Is there sufficient predictable remuneration to incentivize and sustain investment? Are creative artists sufficiently protected through existing rights? Is the current system too complex? especially in areas of rights management and exceptions to copyright? And what are the priorities for seeking domestic, European and international change? So uh, a number of key issues there which the, the copyright review is going to address. I'll finish there. I'm conscious I've probably gone over my, uh, my allotted slot, but uh, I hope I've described for you the key elements of what the UK government is doing. And I, I hope when the OECD reviews comparatively uh, the, the, what governments have been doing that we'll come out with maybe top marks, I don't know. Anyway, it's a lot of work we're doing and uh, as I say, you can follow a lot of the progress on our website. I'll finish there, thanks. Thank you very much, Mark. Anybody in the audience who wants to ask a question, 
please raise your hand and there'll be um, a roving microphone to greet you. So uh, the man in the, in the center of the, of the aisle there, no, no, uh, no, number one was the, was the one in the center there, waving his hand, yes. We're gonna do this in order. So please, we also have WIPO in the, in the audience, I understand. It's very hard to see who's content principles within the OECD. And my point, point was this, that if creativity patterns are changing and becoming more incremental, then everybody has to change. Not only legislation and regulatory frameworks, but also the companies applying them. So your point is well taken. If this is in fact what's happening and law would change to accommodate that and the regulatory frameworks develop, of course every company also needs to examine and re-examine their own positions within this space. Presentation brought out some very key issues on the content and the features of the content, challenges there, and uh, Jeremy's uh, mention of disability as the consumers, I guess, was, is worthy of congratulations. Very happy to hear that. Uh, one aspect which um, I felt uh, could be added to the uh, to the features of the content which were mentioned uh, was is is that a, a key part of the content is that uh, there there are two very major key parts of the content actually one is that uh, one content cannot be accessed in a one single format by everybody so the feature of convertibility of the content could also be recognized as one of the major features of the content that we are talking about and the solutions from the consumer's perspective. Uh, a simple example is that uh, uh, for me, for example, I would need content, I would need to access the content as Braille. Now from the creator of the content, I cannot expect that the creator of the content would take care of uh, this need that uh, I should have the access to that content in Braille. But what the creator can do is to comply with an, an open standard which takes care of this aspect of convertibility. And the needs of certain communities that have a tougher time accessing content. That's a great desire. But to fold that in somehow to a treaty-based scheme like, like Jeremy talked about, I believe really misses the point of where innovation comes from. The innovation that actually would enable the serving the people that, that you just talked about is innovation that's sponsored by market-based innovation. It's by the, what did you call it, uh, Nicholas, the German romantic model of 14 days in the dark coming up. That's how I wrote my code for eRealty, 14 days in the dark. We still do it that way, and we do it because we expect to be compensated in some way, and it changes all the time. I mean, uh, Jeremy had talked about uh, the A2 access to knowledge, a treaty some sort of uniform across the globe treaty that would lock into place exactly how content has to be distributed and how standards have to be applied. Uh, the, where's the flexibility there? I mean, fr frankly, if, if, if Jeremy says he's going to achieve balance with a treaty, an access to knowledge treaty, the balance would be at whatever was negotiated in a static point in time. And that balance would call for the involuntary expropriation of creators' content versus the market which achieves balance by consumers deciding whether and how they want to access content and creators deciding whether and how they want to provide it. So, I mean, if access to knowledge and, and your constituents want to find a way to pay a content creator, to get content, find a way to pay a content creator. Because you can, you can definitely motivate the market to deliver content in innovative ways. It's like Samuel Johnson once said, that seldom is a man more innocently engaged than in the making of money. And, and you, can, you can actually scratch that itch in a lot of different ways. Just a mental response or an intergovernmental response. Um, well, there are other options. There are you know, normative responses from within the community and the open source software community is a very good example of that. That's uh, something that, that didn't come from within government at all and so I'm certainly not saying that there always needs to be a governmental response. But uh, where we're living within a, an environment where intellectual property laws are set out by intergovernmental treaty, that's when we need to look at going back to governments to deliver exceptions and limitations that serve the needs of disadvantaged users. And we're not necessarily talking about uh, um, involuntary appropriation of, of content. Um, there are cases in which a limitation or exception to copyright law can be made subject to fair remuneration to the copyright owner. 
a license, uh, and, and there are many examples of this in copyright law, where um, if you want to, say, for example, record a, uh, a musical, another version of a musical work, you can be required to pay a license fee that is set down in law. You don't have to go into negotiations with the copyright owner. The law provides for a compulsory license. And that's the same thing that we can talk about uh, if, we're, um, if we're trying to introduce new copyright exceptions or limitations for disadvantaged users. And uh, as many of you will know, the World Blind Union was um, recently proposing a treaty specifically for visually impaired users um, at the WIPO SCCT meeting, which was held last month. And, uh, and that was unfortunately, uh, the, although there was great support from that, from um, across stakeholder groups, that didn't go any further because the committee decided that uh, no, that wasn't the way to proceed. And I think we need to uh, continue to look at WIPO's responsiveness to users who, to, to users rather than just creators. Um, this has begun with the introduction of WIPO's um, development agenda, but I think we're only at the beginning of, of trying to reform that institution to become a bit more balanced. So, uh, yeah, my response in summary is that uh, we don't need to necessarily be taking away from uh, content creators. We just need to be uh, fulfilling a need that the market cannot provide uh, in a way that's fair to both users and creators. Yeah, a very short uh, comment on that is that the European Union is now have they have a green paper consultation out on transformative use for different kinds of accessibility issues, and I think you find that within that context, many companies are happy to accept either a kind of license which is very broad or a kind of exceptional limitation on the existing copyright regime because it enables innovation from a new perspective. It's another way of putting the market into play because there are so many innovators out there that know if there might be such a license or such an exception, they will build a very good business model to make sure business models to make sure that this content is, is, is accessible. So, and another comment would be that if you really spent 14 days in the dark, you should have checked SourceForge, man. <laughs> but if I were to do that and I modify an open source code, I have to give it away to the world, which is, I think the gentleman from the audience called Google on that because Google uses code, modifies it, and doesn't redistribute it. So remember, there's some rules there that we have to play by. I think this is getting interesting among, among the panel. Here. I think, however, we do have another question um, from the audience. In open standards, uh, do you accept the European Union definition of open standards? Uh, because there's very many definitions, and does that definition include a royalty-free definition? Thanks. And in all, all areas where they're holding um, information to make this available to the maximum extent possible, either um, uh, free of intellectual property rights or if they are holding copyrights on behalf of others, for example, in archives and whatever, try to make sure that this information is available um, with the consent of owners, of course, in the ways which are the least restrictive possible. So I think that we cover that. You might want to look at the, the um, public sector information recommendation at the back there, but we're also working to try and make sure the public sector information is available and is accessed readily and is available as widely as possible to as many users as possible on a non-discriminatory and uh, competitive basis. So thank you for the question. I will now pass it back to the, the panel. Would be missing access to that market. Uh, that's a choice Amazon might make, right? But fortunately, you and your your constituencies are not limited at all. You can use the bookshare.org or other applications. I think the choice has been preserved in the current system, which is why, again, I question the need for a couple of you who said we need a national, uh, international treaty or we need to have a brand new set of dictated standards for exactly how things have to be programmed. Um, by listening to the, the experts, I think that we can um, reach the conclusion that we have to deepen the analysis on two very important issues um, regarding the digital agenda of the uh, WIPO Internet Treaties, uh, the issue regarding the implementation of limitations and exceptions at national level, and perhaps also the correct um, um, 
implementation of the rule of Google is twofold. One is, of course, to make sure that we have an intellectual property rights system that promotes innovation and does not stifle it. I think that's really important. And the way that you design it economically will decide whether or not it does one or the other. The second part is that I think we have the role of trying to develop something you could call a hybrid economy, where you can have the entire set of user-created content meet up with different kinds of monetization models. One example, of course, would be YouTube, where the different kinds of identification techniques, which are similar to the ones that Steve mentioned earlier on MySpace, allow for users to choose whether or not they want their t uh, content taken down or if they want it monetized. Up to 90% choose to have it left up to the, on the website and to monetize it when they discover that they have their content on our website, which is for them a very good deal and they're very happy about it. So we have a twofold role here, I think. One is to, to make sure that we have the optimum level of innovation in our society. And the second one, I think, is to make sure that creators are remunerated in a reasonable, quick, technologically advanced, and in every sense, um, good way. I think, I think that's, that's the, the ideal role we would like to have. Then, of course, I mean, we, we're still trying to figure this new thing out, too, so we have a lot of work left to do. Copyright protection for music from 50 to 95 years, and that was after economic evidence which showed one, uh, a study in the UK, the Gower study, which said actually it would not help creativity or innovation, and it actually wouldn't help artists either. And also a, a study which the European Commission itself commissioned from the University of Amsterdam saying the same thing, that it would not help innovation or artists if you extend the protection from 50 to 95 years. And, uh, you know, we have a distinguished panel. I think everyone's advocating uh, a, reg a copyright regime which is sort of like more flexible, which would help creativity and innovation and economic growth. But I've not really seen uh, a country take, unless you know better, take up this challenge and actually revise the copyright regime, either in the especially in the developed world. Um, the various intellectual property treaties that uh, limit what they can do. Um, but within that context, certainly there is a lot of flexibility. And uh, Consumers International did a, um, a survey of 11 countries a couple of years ago to see the extent to which they take advantage of the flexibilities that are already available in the international copyright uh, regime. We were focused on copyright in that case, not looking at patents. Um, and uh, we found that many countries in the, in the Asia Pacific region uh, didn't actually take advantage of the flexibilities that they had available to them. Um, and uh, so that was a concern to us from a consumer point of view. Uh, we're currently embarking on a new project uh, which is called the Access to Knowledge Watch List, where we're going to be looking at 25 to 30 countries around the world, not just in the Asia Pacific region this time, and we're going to be ranking them by how favourable their intellectual property laws are to consumers. And uh, so that may provide something of an answer to what you're looking for. You, you're looking for, are there any countries around the world that have a more balanced copyright regime that, that does um, both serve the interests of um, consumers as well as creators? And uh, hopefully when we publish this Access Knowledge Watch List, that will be a resource that will be able to identify the, the countries around the world that um, have achieved or, or are close to achieving that balance. So look out for that uh, probably around uh, March or April next year. Okay, thanks very much. Now I'm going to surpri surprise the panel by asking each one of them to give me one area that, you, that we, they think that we or anybody else could examine in detail or one policy action that um, countries or OECD could promote uh, in the near future. This will give us some ideas for our future work program in this area, of course. So if I could start with going back in the reverse order, I just want one. One from each. So I'll start with Nicholas, of course. So, if I may. So one policy area. One policy area, one issue that we should uh, examine in more detail. What do you think is the highest priority area on your list? Oh, bummer. I got to go first. So, yes, exactly. okay, you guys got time to think. Um, so, I think that the policy area that would be most interesting and most promising to look at substantially would be the issue of limitations and ex ex exceptions. Um, we've already heard that this is something that is happening on the international level within WIPO, within the European Union, and I think we'll see it in other places too. So, a, an engaged, closer look at that would probably be very fruitful. Okay. Mark. Well, I, I talked about um, you know, the, the um, intellectual property uh, area as, as the kind of the key 
regulatory environment which impinges most of all on, on the content uh, sector. So I guess I, I, I would gravitate towards that as, as um, the key area to look at. If, you know, what, what, what is working against the industry and what, is, what, is, you know, what does need to be changed? Where, where is there good regulatory practice that uh, we can all uh, draw on? I, th I think it has to be that. Um, I mean, we, we're certainly looking at this. This is what the, um, um, the copyright review will, will, will address and the key questions that are outlined. So for the OECD to complement what we're doing is, it's, and for us to input into the OECD work in this area would be an important uh, thing for us to do, connecting up with yourself. That's me. Thanks, Jeremy. So, so something more like this. Thanks, Mark. Now, Jeremy, please. Uh, thanks. Well, um, I would select um, other mechanisms for promoting innovation other than intellectual property rights. And uh, there are various examples of these that uh, people have started to look into, for example, um, prizes uh, for innovation and that sort of thing. So that would be one area that I'd suggest looking at. Uh, as I have spoken uh, during the, this one, uh, I would like to recommend promoting and enabling environment because I come from the industry. So where governments have a lot to create the enabling environment uh, uh, with academia as well as uh, skills development programs and uh, bringing uh, all the ecosystem into a single platform. Uh, I think that is required uh, very much, particularly in this part of the world. Because, yeah. And now Steve, please. The one item I would advise you to look at is examine the regimes around the world to see to what extent they provide liability or immunity for platforms for the content that users generate on those platforms. Simple example, if, if I put a video on YouTube that violates some law somewhere, you can't be holding Google and YouTube liable for that. That would um, completely squash the innovation that happens on platforms. Now, if an official notifies Google about a YouTube video that has to be taken down, and Google will have to respond to that in accordance with the law, but the point is don't hold people liable for third-party content and conduct. Okay. And finally, Santosh, please. Um, I want to give a little bit of statistics before my question. Um, the area to look at, India has a billion people. There are only 44 million people who have personal computers. India has a billion people. There are only 14 million people who have internet connections. India has a billion people. There are only about 2 to 3 million people who have broadband connections, which are greater than 518 kilobits per second. So if, if I would say if there's one area that, that you can focus on is to figure out how can the developing nations, or the so-called developed nations, or nations who don't even factor into these developing nations, what can government do to increase this broadband penetration? Because a lot of the discussions that we heard from the audience and many of the panelists focused on how do you monetize intellectual property, how do you monetize content. But, but it's so far away be, from doing that in the developed world because you just don't even have, the people don't even have access. So, so my point is, how, you know, what can we learn? What can governments do? What can policymakers do? What can industry do to change that equation? Thank you, very, thank you very much. It was a nice re reality check at the end of our session. I'd like us all to thank our panel, which I thought was excellent. We had a very good discussion, so I'd like to thank them all. Thank you. Thank you, each other. And uh, thank you all. And thank